welcome to The Rob Burgess Show. I am, of course, your host, Rob Burgess. On this, our 163rd episode, a returning guest is Sarah Kenzier. You first heard Sarah Kenzier on episodes 70, 80, 89, 99, 112, 128, 138, and 150. Sarah Kenzier is best known for her reporting on St. Louis, her coverage of the 2016 election, and her academic research on authoritarian states. She is currently an op-ed columnist for The Globe and Mail, and she was named by Foreign Policy as one of the 100 people you should be following on Twitter to make sense of global events. Her reporting has been featured in many publications including Politico, Slate, The Atlantic, Fast Company, The Chicago Tribune, Teen Vogue, and The New York Times. Her book, The View from Flyover Country, Dispatches from the Forgotten America, was published April 17, 2018, and is now a New York Times bestseller. Her new book, Hiding in Plain Sight, will be published April 7, 2020. You can listen to her podcast, which she co-hosts with Andrea Chalupa, Gaslit Nation. And now on to the show. How are you feeling? Well, I mean, I, I'm okay. I don't have coronavirus or anything like that, but... You know, psychologically, I think I feel like everybody else. Uh, how about you? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> pretty much the same thing. Yeah, it's it's been crazy. I, I just, you know, uh, going to Target has been an experience that's been a pretty harrowing experience these last few weeks. <laughs> Do they have it divided where you live, like where you have to be six feet apart in the demarcated areas? Mm-mm. No, I think they're going to start that soon, probably at least at Walmart. I don't go to Walmart, but I've heard they're going to start doing that at Walmart here soon. But Yeah, we have it at a couple places, but not not that. We have it at Walgreens, but we haven't had it at the big stores yet. And basically, I'm not planning on leaving this house for like two and a half weeks and hoping we have enough to like get through that. But we'll see. <laughs> it's insane. Yeah, but I mean, how how long have you, because I feel like I've been so ahead of the curve just because I feel like people that, for once, people that read Twitter are more informed than people that are out in the, out in the yeah. world or whatever, because like, I usually don't feel like I'm smarter for having read Twitter, but I feel like I read Twitter the last couple of weeks, I'm like, I actually feel like I know what's going on before people around me, because people, just two weeks ago, like somebody I went to high school with went on a booze cruise. I couldn't believe it. Oh my god. No, I mean, I have been I've been hesitant to do anything basically since late January because I I got very worried like seeing the videos from Wuhan and then from Iran and then from Italy. And so I had a couple of like paid talks that I had to do and I had tickets to monster trucks, so I went to that, but that was in January. Um and other than that, honestly, like I was living like a recluse and I was stalking at my basement and my husband thought I was like being a little bit nuts you know but it turned out to be the right thing to do because we didn't have to stock up later in the month and just uh i don't know the stock the stockpile in the basement is also like a tornado stockpile an infrastructure hack stockpile a world war with iran stockpile so it's just sort of like a all-purpose uh you know supply area it's oh my god to not have to live like this would be so great yeah Absolutely. Well, you know, I somehow thought <laughs> this is one of the reasons uh, we were all so upset when Trump was elected, because uh, I was like, I, I, if you'd have told me then that I'd be stockpiling food now, I would have totally believed you. For some reason, I knew that I would have to. <laughs> I didn't know what, why exactly. but <laughs> Oh, yeah. I had to check my stockpile because it's... <laughs> It's been ever expanding. Like it started. I mean, I had some things just for you know, because we get tornadoes and stuff. You know how it is. So like, I always have like a few things down there, like just in case, like water and some food. But then it started growing once he was elected, and then I was just like sort of checking expiration dates on stuff. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's what I expected. And anyone who watched his reaction to like Hurricane Maria or to any of these natural disasters knows that he's not going to do anything in a crisis other than savor it and that, you know, we are left to our own devices. And when you live in a state that's a, you know, Republican governed state at that level and then locally is struggling for resources anyway, of course you prepare in advance. It's just common sense, you know? Mm hmm. Well, it's just like, do we even have a president? I don't operate that way, to be honest. Like, I don't check with that for information. Like, I check with local authorities, I guess, if I want to know something about it. Can I go out of my house today or whatever? But, like, any those press briefings are useless. Like, it's like, he can't have his little rallies, so this is what he's doing instead. And it's like, there's no, this is no, there's no factual information being conveyed here. 
<laughs> oh, those, they should be airing those at all. Like, I've been very adamant about that. Those have replaced the rallies. They supplanted them. And, you know, today I saw some sort of screenshot from MSNBC where the anchors were saying, like, you know, the nation is transfixed by the daily briefings. And, like, no, they're not. Like, they're appalled. And it's the only thing that's on. Like, that is why they're watching it, is because all of you have decided at once to air these simultaneously and not for scientific information, not for public health uh, or safety information, but for him and his endless reality TV autocracy. And it's grotesque. I, I mean, they haven't learned anything. And you would think like a tragedy at this level with millions expected to get sick and probably hundreds of thousands will die like that. This of all moments would be a time of, you know, solemnity where they would reject this kind of tactics that helped create him and helped, uh, you know, like heighten his power. And instead, they're they are increasing it and they're accomplices to to that mass murder. Well, it's all this dear leader worship. It's so weird in America to see that. It's just like, who are you people? Like, why do you need to tell us five times in the same sentence how great a job he's doing? And it's like, just get to the point. Like, who cares? Like, this this ego stroking in public is just disgusting. <laughs> you mean those folks who are on the stage with him? Like the pseudo doctors and... Yeah, I mean, honestly, I, I can't watch it. Like, I don't watch it in part just out of protest. Like, I'll read the summary to see if I, you know, if anything important transpires so that I'm not completely uninformed. But I can't watch that kind of ritualistic, you know, autocratic sycophancy. It reminds me so much of what I would see from meetings, uh, you know, from Uzbekistan or Tajikistan or Turkmenistan that would be uh, you know, they'd be filmed and put on the internet in order to instill a propaganda message for the citizens of that country that this is the way you are required to act and this is the way that our dictator will be treated no matter what he does. And to see that in America and then see the press just reiterating it voluntarily, I mean, they don't, I I assume they don't have to. I mean, probably if you work at Fox, you do have to, but uh, you know, we still do have some measure of freedom of choice and freedom of speech, and they've chosen to back this. And uh, it's like watching, you know, Jim Jones or Charlie Manson as the president. You know, there's there's much more of an element of that kind of personality this time around than there is to the, you know, kleptocrats and autocrats that he paralleled more, I think, in the earlier parts of his his term. Oh, absolutely. But um, but turning to your book, <laughs> um, how is it doing a virtual book tour? It's it's different than I'm sure you expected. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's out on Tuesday. And so everything is like, it's so chaotic. Um, we're doing a virtual event on Monday with Left Bank Books and uh, with uh, St. Louis Public Radio. That was supposed to happen, you know, here in St. Louis on Tuesday. Uh, of course, every per in-person event is canceled. I had like a 10 city tour that was canceled. Uh, then we're doing another virtual event with politics and prose in Washington, D.C. And I think that's on April 9th. I don't exactly know how these are going to go. Um, you know, I, I'm trying to keep things in perspective because people are facing much greater tragedy and hardship than me, obviously. Uh, but I do feel sad. You know, I like going on my tour. I like being able to meet my readers. Um, you know, it's a really enjoyable experience because writing is a, a lonely occupation. Uh, and, you know, in the midst of this national tragedy, you know, I'd like to be able to talk to people about it because it's a it's a public health crisis, but it's also a political crisis. And in my book, In Hiding in Plain Sight, I get at how this transpired at not only Trump's rise, but the erosion and breakdown of our institutions, of all the people that are supposed to protect us failing at every turn. And, you know, now they're failing in this way that is just, you know, it's fatal uh, to our own lives and to the life of this country. So, yeah, you know, <laughs> I'm hoping that, I mean, if this should pass, you know, if we are allowed freedom of movement and assembly again, uh, I hope to, you know, reinvigorate the tour later in the year. Uh, I can't wait to get out and drive out of state and like get back on the highway and just, you know, move around like it, it's driving me nuts. Uh, so hopefully I'll do that, but we shall see. Yeah, but another thing that's got to be frustrating is, you know, you're writing about current events, but this doesn't come out. There's a lag time, obviously, where it's being edited and 
prepared for publication where you have to turn it in and then just whatever happens in the world just has to not be in the book, right? Well, that's the thing that's so weird about this book is, you know, I wrote it basically over the first half of 2019 and I knew that it was going to come out in April 2020. And so I always said that in the back of my mind. And I'm someone, you know, I've been a journalist in the digital age. So when I wrote something, I knew that it would come up relatively quickly, like within a week. I'd never had this experience of knowing that it would it would take such a long time. So I wrote uh, basically a history, a 40 year history so that it couldn't go out of date. And as I was writing it, all these things about history kept changing. Like, for example, I have a chapter about Jeffrey Epstein, uh, who then got arrested and then died. And so obviously I was rewriting that as I went. Uh, the Mueller probe and the Barr report and the Mueller report were all revealed as I was writing about that. So that changed. But the thing that's weird is that I feel like in many ways, the book stands up better now in April 2020 than it did when I handed it in. Like my, I don't want to like, you know, my editor is very, a very nice person, hardworking woman. You know, she she did a lot to, you know, help with this process, but she did feel like this is very dark. This is very apocalyptic. And she would say to me like, well, what if things are better by April 2020? Like, what if everyone's really excited about the election? They've rallied around a Democratic candidate. The, you know, what if Trump is out of office? Office? What if people are indicted? And I was like, they're not going to be like, none of that is going to happen. Like, I, I know that it's going to be calamitous. It's going to be a catastrophe because at that point, he's going to be doing everything possible to hold on to his power. And, you know, privately, what I thought would be happening now was be something like either a war or a massive attack on infrastructure. Because during the government shutdown in 2019, I saw that as a prelude. I felt like they were testing out, well, what happens if we shut everything down? How will people respond? How will institutions respond? Like, it was basically the same sort of testing that they did in 2014, you know, to map out social media um, before the 2016 election and to test the weakness of those institutions. And so I had a really terrible feeling, but of course I couldn't just flat out say, well, yeah, everybody in April 2020, we're probably all going to be like shut up in our homes looking for resources. I did not envision, um, you know, a pandemic necessarily, like it crossed my mind, but that's not the kind of thing you really, you know, you think of as a purposeful action. Um, but because of that, though, I think the book holds up pretty well. And, you know, there were some sentences I remember kind of arguing about with with the editors and the, especially with the copy editors like there's one towards the end of the book that said we still had the freedom to travel and there's so much to see and they wanted those those tenses to match to either be both in past or both in present and i'm like no by tw by april 2020 we won't have freedom to travel anymore but there still will be things to see and they i i don't know how i can justify why i did that but it it is you know a reflection of what ultimately happened so it's a it's a weird book in that way. But I do think it's a book of the moment. So I guess uh, it has that going for it, a book of a very uh, horrible moment in American history. Yeah, well, definitely. And, you know, it's a little bit different than your first book, obviously, because your first book was a collection of essays. And this was on, like you said, kind of one larger theme. Uh, how was it concentrating for a longer time on a single subject? Obviously, you kind of touched on similar themes in your first book with between all the essays, but they were about, you know, kind of different, different things. So. Yeah. I mean, this was very grueling. I have a lot of respect for anybody who's written a book. You know, I, I'm someone who, I don't know, I, I guess I'm prolific, but the things that I write tend to be succinct, you know, they tend to be shorter pieces and that's just sort of the way I think in my style. And so to write for such a, a long, um, you know, period of time and in such detail, I hadn't done that since my dissertation for my PhD. And it's also, you know, it's a traumatic subject. Uh, it wasn't a fun book to write. It delves into a lot of very dark things, you know, into mafia activity, into Trump's connection to child traffickers uh, and rapists like Epstein, uh, into the failure of our institutions, the failure and corruption of uh, the FBI. It also deals with you know national tragedies like 9-11, the 2008 economic collapse. It's a little bit autobiographical um, because I, of course, had to live through all those things. And I tried to kind of capture that, like what it's like to be 
um, you know, in my generation and our generation and grow up with that, to grow up with this kind of systematic collapse that just keeps uh, increasing year after year. And of course, the book comes out during a plague. It's like so fitting in such a horrible way. Um, but it was tough. I mean, it was like writing through a lot of pain and writing through a lot of anger and frustration and, and fear over the future. But I felt, you know, some satisfaction in just documenting it. I felt like it was a book I was writing more, you know, for the future so that we remember what happened. Because one thing that frustrates me with the news cycle is that we get like a decade worth of news in every day. And that causes people to miss the big picture. It also causes people to miss uh, small but important details and to view them out of context. And so what I wanted to do was contextualize how did this happen? Like, how did Trump and the Republicans in this transnational crime syndicate uh, solidify their power? And why were our institutions so unable to stop them? And why did so many help him? Why did our media help him? Why did the FBI help him? Like, why would any want, anyone want to be part of this sadistic project? And why do people look the other way uh, when so many are getting hurt? Like, those were the questions that were bothering me as I wrote it. You know, they're the same questions that bother me right now. Uh, and they're questions that largely remain unanswered. And so I sort of see this book as part of a broader body of work that will be written about this time, um, you know, that that's complemented by people who focused on other areas, whether religious extremism or a particular financial crime. I think if you put all those together, you could kind of get like an encyclopedia of criminality of the Trump administration and, you know, see that big picture uh, even better. Well, I would was just going to bring up the fact that throughout the book, there is a revolving cast of unsavory characters who keep somehow just popping up, you know, throughout the book, uh, both uh, known mafia types and uh, also people that are known for covering up for other people. William, you mentioned Bill Barr. Um, but uh, yeah, these, these people just keep circling and circling. And, and I think this is really the consequence of Nobody paid a price for previous crimes, therefore the people involved in the previous crimes were allowed to operate in a respectable society again, and were, were able to boomerang back around to this new situation. Um, you know, if you could talk a little bit about some of those reoccurring characters that people, I was especially thinking some of the, the names people might not know. You mentioned Epstein, everyone's heard of that, but what are some of the other people right. that, that might be a little more obscure to the average person? Yeah, no, it is the same cast of characters, and it is for the reasons you name. You know, these are people who have contributed or ran, um, you know, massive American political crimes, ranging from Watergate to Iran Contra to the war in Iraq to the financial crisis. They're now all in the Trump administration or hanging around its fringes, helping with the campaign or linked to them in other ways. Um, you know, among one of the lesser known is um, Semyon Mogilevich, who is the head of the Russian mafia. And he has been that for about 30 years. And he's intimately linked with pretty much um, everyone in the book, you know, either directly or, or a couple degrees away. That includes Jeffrey Epstein. Um, you know, he was connected to the father of Epstein's partner, Jelaine Maxwell. He was connected to Robert Maxwell. He's connected to the Kremlin uh, and thereby to all of the oligarchs that aid the Kremlin and therefore to people like Paul Manafort, uh, who worked directly with Trump. Um, you know, he was tied to the Brooklyn Russian mafia that supplanted the Italian mafia um, in the 80s and 90s, therefore linked to uh, Giuliani. You know, that's someone who I wish I had been able to get a bit more into, uh, you know, because I do think he, he's pivotal. Um, I think Craig Unger and some other authors are working more on that. And Wayne Barrett also covered him as well. Um, and so, yeah, he's this seminal figure and nobody wants to discuss him. And the reason people don't want to discuss him, as I, you know, as I detail in the book, is because he kills people. He threatens people and he kills them. Um, the only real in-depth English language book on him that I know of is Red Mafia by Robert I. Friedman that came out, I believe, in 2000. And he was killed two years later, allegedly from some sort of mysterious ailment. Um, you know, they're not officially classifying as murder. I'm suspicious. I mean, as if you read the book, so many people in it 
died, um, you know, from either mysterious circumstances or were murdered that when I was referring to Wayne Barrett, you know, the great journalist who wrote about Trump, I had to specify this guy died of cancer. You know, he died a natural death. He wasn't among the many uh, who were killed for investigating this uh, crime syndicate and all of the political actors connected to it. And so that's a scary thing, you know, and I am somewhat afraid uh, about the repercussions of writing this book. Uh, You know, this is a book I wrote for a mainstream audience. You know, I want the average American or whoever to be able to just pick it up. Um, You know, I tried to make it as easy to read in that respect as possible, um, despite the zillion footnotes, but those are necessary too, you know, to prove that, no, I'm not making this up. It really is as bad as it seems. And so I hope that that, uh, you know, brings some attention to this. You know, originally, Robert Mueller was a person who was investigating the Mogilevich operation, and he was doing that quite intensely toward the end of his tenure at the FBI, especially in 2011. And then suddenly it's just dropped and he gets dropped off the FBI uh, top 10 most wanted list. Uh, You know, Comey does nothing about it. Comey basically, you know, aids Trump's election. Two other former FBI heads, William Sessions and Louis Free, went on to consult with people attached uh, to the Russian mafia. All of that is very disturbing. You know, it implies that our government has been infiltrated for a very long time uh, and that we don't just have this nexus of white collar crime and state corruption and uh, organized crime, you know, that I've mentioned many times before and that Mueller himself mentioned, you know, we have had essentially treasonous bodies working right under our noses for, I think, most of our lives. It's really made me reevaluate world history. It makes me reevaluate things like the collapse of the Soviet Union itself. And I'm someone who, you know, as a PhD student, like when, when I was getting my degree in anthropology, uh, that was what I studied. So you'd think if, if something was up, I and all the other academics would have maybe picked up on it. But I think because it's so difficult to, uh, scho- in a scholarly way, study organized crime, it's not like you go out and you do your field work, you know, you can't exactly do that kind of thing and go around interviewing people. Um, it didn't really get investigated. And I think there was also timidity from reporters. And also there's just so many other things going wrong. Like we had 9-11 and the attacks, which shifted so much focus onto Islamic terrorism. We had the collapse of the global economy. So everyone's looking at that. And that allowed this particular kind of criminality to just go on right under our noses. And people like Donald Trump, who are, you know, just in the midst of this cesspool, got image makeovers, got built up and given television shows and, you know, sold to the masses and then became, you know, the president. And that's a terrifying thing. That's, you know, the end of the American experiment. And, uh, you know, I don't know where we go from here. I've had some some people from the Southern Poverty Law Center on before, and, and uh, I've read about this, about how the United Clans of America uh, were broken up in the 80s. And after that happened, the large national organization, they said, okay, now we're going to, we're not going to be this centralized thing anymore. We're just going to infiltrate police forces and and you know we're going to be in respectable society in places of power and we're going to get in that way and it kind of I, mm-hmm. I i couldn't help but reading your book kind of think of the same thing about like well putin for example he was mr kgb and then he just slipped right into you know <laughs> slipped right into power and you know now he's uh, mr you know he's president for what how when, when is he going to be president tell again what what is it what the what's the year 2036 now? Yeah, apparently exactly it's like <laughs> these people don't really change. Yeah. They just they just kind of slither their way uh, in the in the confusion into places of power and just kind of entrench themselves there. It seems like that's the way it seems. Yeah, to go. and I think that you know what you just brought up of like these you know white nationalist groups or militia groups or what have you becoming increasingly a part of mainstream law enforcement. You know, and you also see that with religious extremists increasingly taking up positions of power, like people like Pompeo or bar. Um, and that also began in the early, you know, late seventies, early eighties under Reagan, this all happened in tandem. And all of these different groups were working with each other. Like Jeff Shartlett's, uh, the family is a good example of this as is Jane Meyer's dark money. Like there are all these parallel histories that basically commence, um, you know, around the time I was born in like the late seventies, early eighties. And bring our country down this very dark journey that seems to culminate 
in the present moment. And it was a journey that I'm not sure we were entirely aware we were on. I mean, everyone knew that these people existed. Everyone knew that they were gaining footholds and, and infiltrating themselves into mainstream positions. But I don't think people realized how fragile we were and how vicious their objectives were and how anti-American um, they are. I mean, that's the thing that always gets me. I'm like, so this just doesn't mean anything to you, does it? Like this country doesn't mean anything to you. When you go out, you know, when you see the flag, when you go to the Lincoln Memorial, when you go to a national park, like that just, what, it just leaves you cold? You just see that as a resource to hoard and mine and steal from people? Like, it's a strange thing, you know, because I, I do love this country. I'm incredibly frustrated with this government uh, and I'm obviously afraid for the future. But, you know, I'm an American and I, I don't feel like there's like some other place that I belong. I belong here. And it is weird to think that there's this entire body of interlocked people uh, that feel differently and that have, um, you know, a pretty organized collective ambition to destroy that for so many millions of us um, and that they're winning. You know, it's it's a really scary thing. And then, of course, coronavirus gives them ample opportunity, uh, I think, to exploit that ambition. It also potentially gives you know, us the opportunity to rework our society in a more equitable way. And that's, you know, what I'm hoping will happen. But um, the fact that this emerged now is is really frightening. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, I, I'm i amazed about Trump and, and them who have gone from minimizing the crisis until it can't be minimized anymore. And then they figure out how they're going to exploit it. And I think we're already seeing that when I saw the thing about Bill Barr wanting to just, just go put a hold on that old Constitution thing. <laughs> for a while I was like all right here we go all right I knew they'd get to yeah. it eventually <laughs> this is what always happens you know it's like he can't like this is a crisis that he is responsible for people are finally going to understand it he can't talk his way out of this the virus isn't going to listen uh you know to him tweeting at it uh you know he can't he can't bully this in the submission this is gonna, people are going to turn on him now but I feel like there's a real uh, you talk about it in the book too against your own better uh, instincts you end up normalizing it because you have to live your life under these conditions oh yeah well i think there's a difference i mean when you have a public health crisis i think psychologically like you have to just you have to adjust to that new reality you have to do what you need to survive you have to do what you need to protect other people in case you're infected you have to follow you know these regulations that are incredibly jarring and that have turned our lives upside down and under a transparent democratic government, I, I think that we would be less sort of freaked out on a existential level. Like it's obviously a very frightening virus um, and then the economic effects are overwhelming as well. But I think there would be more trust in the future. Like they, we would see it as more like, okay, you know, we've got to rally together and then we've got to try to just get through this terrible time and support each other. And there is some element of that. You know, I certainly see that on a local level. But what people are terrified of is what Barr is doing in the meantime. You know, this indefinite detention of people for no reason or labeling people as disease or using this as an excuse for mass surveillance. You know, I think a lot of us remember how many of our rights were surrendered in the aftermath of 9-11, you know, in a similar climate of fear. And so we're all very wary of going back to that. And then also with the financial collapse, so many people feel, you know, the emotional scars of that as well. So it's kind of like it's PTSD, you know, for the country, like we're reliving all of these horrible moments. But that's what um, it's a very frustrating situation, because if you are interested and invested in protecting our democracy, this is a nightmare, you know, like just like voting, for example, like, do you tell people to vote or not? You know, if they go and they vote and they congregate in, in some way or touch a machine that someone else has touched, they are potentially risking their health. And how do you tell someone to do that? Um, but if they don't vote, then what happens? Like, do we have a democracy? I mean, and this is why I've been encouraging things like you need to do vote by mail and you need to start it now. You need to get organized now. Assume the worst. Assume coronavirus will still be here in November uh, because otherwise Trump is going to try to cancel this election and he's actually going to have you know, somewhat of a pretext to do it. And they're already trying to fend that off. Like the Republicans want to shut down the Postal Service. They're saying we can't afford it anymore. Trump is speaking out against vote by mail. I mean, they'll do 
whatever they can to stay in power. Uh, but it's that kind of moment. You know, if I had a government, I, didn't, I wouldn't even have to like them that much. I don't think it's healthy to like love your government. You know, governments, public officials are there to serve you. They're there to be critiqued. But if I didn't think this was like an aspiring dictator who literally got off on death, who's like a sadist psychopath, I certainly would feel a lot better right now. You know, like I like my, um, my county executive in St. Louis. Like, I don't feel like he's out to kill me, but I look at, at Trump uh, and Pence and the rest of them, and I'm like, yeah, that's pretty much what they're doing. You know, they want to strip the country down, uh, you know, tear it down for parts. Trump, I think, on a personal level, gets off on mass death. I think others feel like this might be the rapture or they're trying to hurry up the rapture. I think Pompeo is trying to do that. I'm wary of this week because there's so many holy days in it. And I'm like, oh, God, what if they start something in the Middle East? Like, so all those thoughts are in my head. Uh, I would love to live a life without those thoughts in my head. That would be a uh, that would be super, but I don't see myself returning to that way of life anytime soon. Yeah, like uh, when I went, it's funny, when I looked your book up on uh, Amazon, it was number one in democracy, and I was like, oh no, <laughs> I'm happy for Sarah, but democracy is not looking so good if Sarah's number one in democracy. It's also number one in fascism, though. Oh, it's wow, number one okay. in both, which I just think says everything. <laughs> like, nice. It's all. number one in democracy, number one in fascism, and number one in presidents of the United States states so oh, there you like, go you got that's the trifecta what? that's that's you can't get any better than that that's awesome <laughs> oh, yeah, just what i dreamed of as a little girl is to be number one in fascism and have it be about my own country it's just what we want right exactly um yeah i'm sure you made a vision board of that but um <laughs> No, well, China, you know, it's interesting because I wanted to, obviously, uh, being an authoritarianism expert, it's got to have make your head spin lately with uh, when I heard, for example, the WHO, uh, you know, and, and I, I don't think they're completely without merit, but let me get to that. They said China, had, had they did a good job uh, on this and, and they locked everything down. Okay, well, a couple things about that. First of all, yeah, I guess on the back end, authoritarianism is the one system that is ready to go when they need to martial law or like, you know, separate children from their families. Whenever that's happening, they're, they're on it. They, that's what they're made to do, right? But when the beginning parts of it are happening, when you could actually have a chance to stop it, like with that uh, doctor that sadly died that was, treat, was trying to tell blow the whistle uh, fairly early on and then he was arrested, it's like you don't have a free press, you don't have freedom of speech, uh, you're arrested for, for telling the truth when you were just trying to stop this from happening. So in that case, authoritarianism is not the best system, but I feel like you can probably you probably know more about this than I do, but like India, Brazil, uh, Hungary, all these other places, democracy is on the retreat uh, and it's you know because of, well, not because of, but it's exacerbated by at least this whole coronavirus thing and, and they're using this as a pretext to enact all their, non-democratic ways and i fear that you know it's already being set up that that's going to look like the the winner after all this and it's like look at these democracies that couldn't keep their their house in order you know yeah i think that that's definitely the pattern that the trump administration seeks to emulate and i think you know the two closest examples are Hungary, you know, which formalized what was already an autocracy under Orban, but it expanded its powers using the pretext of the virus. And also Israel with Netanyahu, who's been indicted multiple times, who plenty of politicians in, in Israel have been trying to get rid of him because uh, he's incredibly corrupt and he's cruel. Um, and, you know, there are other people who, you know, were actually people voted for them and, you know, they should be taking his place. He's still there and he's using coronavirus as a pretext. He is one of this administration's key advisors. He's somebody who's known Kushner since Kushner was a child. He used to sleep at Kushner's house when he would visit uh, the United States. I wrote about that relationship quite a bit in the book. And so, that um, that dynamic concerns me a lot because I feel like they're going to take uh, you know cues from each other and Kushner I think is guiding this much more than Trump is in terms of a, a policy level and that means that Netanyahu is but yeah we see it worldwide um, you know certainly with Brazil we saw it with the UK under Johnson you know I, f I think it's very interesting that this emerged right after Brexit I keep wondering what would have happened there you know had Brexit not taken place would that have changed people's minds 
minds maybe about uh, Brexit being a a bad idea. But yeah, you know, uh, autocrats never waste a crisis. And with China, um, you know, I feel terribly for their doctors and their nurses. And their videos were what convinced me that this was incredibly serious. Like for a long time, the WHO was refusing to call this a pandemic. They were playing it down. The CDC was playing it down. But I saw those videos and also from uh, Iran and then eventually Italy. And I was like, oh my God, like this is horrible. There are people collapsing on the street. You know, there are p- the piles of bodies being uh, put into morgues. Like this is obviously much more serious than anyone is letting on. And so, you know, the see, I, I just I'm grateful to them. I think they saved a lot of lives, not just in their own countries, but by posting it online, they saved lives around the world. Um, but yeah, you know, I don't think an autocratic system is a necessity towards managing a public health crisis. It's true, you know, that in China, uh, people complied with the law out of fear. And one of my fears, by the way, with China is how exactly is this playing out in the Uyghur camps, you know, in Xinjiang, where they've been holding Uyghur Muslims for a long time. And I'm sure they're not actually treating them uh, for coronavirus. And that's that's worried me. But then you look at other countries that have handled it very well, like South Korea, you know, where they had testing right away, where they had, you know, free medical care right away, and they flattened the curve right away. And, you know, they're a democracy. They're a democracy that overthrew their own corrupt ruler through mass protest. And they're also, I think, a society that seems to have a high level of social trust. And so people were willing to follow the guidance of their officials, thinking, you know, they are looking out for my best interests. And that's just sorely lacking here, and for good reason, because our officials often are not looking out for our best interests. And for me, you know, as a person who is extremely wary of authority and of, you know, this particular government, it's been hard um, to just follow these guidelines. Like, I've done it because I don't want to be like a vector of disease. Like, I don't want to hurt anybody. And so, you know, I'm, I'm following the advice of scientists and medical professionals. But at the same time, I'm very worried about like, well, what rights are we all ceding right now without even knowing it? Will we look back at this time and think, oh, God, you know, we should have done this or that differently. But we're in a bind. You know, there's no good way to react to this crisis that manages to both protect yourself and your family and protect your civil liberties. You kind of have to fight on all fronts and they contradict each other. And that's very hard to do. Ugh. Yeah, I know. Uh, but last time we talked about, you, know, you mentioned the election and uh, you mentioned you supported Elizabeth Warren. And uh, I think, you know, obviously that she didn't get the, the nomination, but I think whatever else happened, she did stop Michael Bloomberg from buying the nomination. And I, I think that is, that, that, that's got to be some kind of trophy on, on somebody's wall. But um, what do you think about the state of play as far as Bernie and, and Joe and like, should Bernie drop out? Should, should we just throw our weight behind Joe? Behind, you know, given all all the things that are legitimately concerning about his candidacy, uh, just you know, like what what do we, what do we do at this point? <laughs> yeah, it's it's frustrating. Uh, you know, I think Warren was head and shoulders above everyone, and and you know, Bloomberg is just such a shithead. Like he came barging into that election. Warren knocked him out. He vowed to give billions, you know, to aid the Democrats in defeating Trump. So he's given them $18 million. He won't give money or very much money to help with the coronavirus struggle. Neither will most billionaires. So, you know, Elizabeth Warren and also Bernie Sanders' views on billionaires are completely validated by the way that these people have reacted to the most massive public health crisis of our lifetimes, which is with extreme selfishness and greed. Um, The Democrats are a mess. I mean, I don't know what they're doing. Obviously, I'm going to vote for whoever it is, and it's going to be Biden, I think, just because, you know, he has the the amount of votes that he needs. But I keep looking at these press conferences that the Trump group, you know, puts out every day. And I'm like, why aren't the Democrats doing this? You know, every now and again, you see, you know, a little bit from Bernie and from Biden. But I'm just thinking as a coalition, as like a collective group of people with, you know, from different regions, with different areas of expertise, why aren't they coming out and having some kind of like alternative to the Trump show and including scientists and medical professionals and, you know, putting out their best communicators, like people like 
Katie Porter or Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez or Warren. Like there are so many people uh, who I think would attract the interest of the nation who could also provide them valuable information about public health and about the economic devastation. And also just like, hey, everybody, here's what the Republicans are doing. Like, we're going to cut through all the Republican crap that the media is refusing to just break down for you as propaganda and lies and tell you what's up. Like, I I just don't get it. They are so timid and quiet and they surrender in advance. And this is a time where we really need, you know, strong officials to speak up. Individually, they do. But I feel like the leadership, like Pelosi and Schumer, do not want that. They don't want a strong, united front. They kind of just want like a little cult around Biden. And <laughs> that's not going to happen. I mean, Biden just doesn't seem to be up for the moment, you know, like he, he lacks the energy and the fortitude. I mean, I'm sure like all of us, he's shocked by this. Like it's, it's deeply jarring. It's very hard to cope with. And, but if you're going to be the president of the United States, like this is what you need to handle. This is what you need to be prepared for our massive crises. Like we're, we're, you know, entrusting our lives to you, our children's lives to you. Like, where are you? And so that uh, that's very unsettling to me. I don't know how it's going to play out in November. I can't see him as like a real fighter. Like if Trump does a whole bunch of dirty shit and, you know, we all know he's going to, I can't see him as somebody who's going to hit back hard. And I really want somebody who will, who will fight for this country and, you know, and fight for our rights and fight for a fair election. And I'm sure he wants a fair election, but I don't know if he'll fight for it. Mm. Well, lucky for us, Tulsi Gabbard is still running. So that. Oh, wait, no, no, she she dropped out and endorsed Biden. Oh, for she? real? Oh, no, so I, I missed that. I, I, didn't realize, I didn't realize. Okay, wow. I, I, I saw that and I was like, oh my God, oh, those Bernie people are going to lose their shit. Yeah, she she endorsed Biden, like just right off the bat, unprompted. It was around the time where coronavirus, you know, had officially become like a national crisis. And I think she basically was like, you know what? Even for me, like this is too much. I got to just bow out now, but... Um, but Bernie's still hanging in there. Yeah, absolutely. But do you think he should drop out or do you think he should keep going just to push his issues? I think it almost doesn't matter. I mean, I feel like what he should do is hopefully what he is doing, which is using the leverage he has to make the Democratic platform and just generally the Democratic agenda uh, more fair, especially in terms of economic rights and in terms of our reaction to the coronavirus crisis. Because what we're getting now, you know, these little one time $1,200 checks, we get Steve Mnuchin, you know, who is like a long time, uh, you know, corporate raider, white collar criminal who's been managing the treasury that was hijacked by the Russians in 2015. Like, this is a disaster. We're just basically giving him trillions of dollars to play around with and hand off to his goons. Like, people need to be on top of that. And Bernie has been arguing for, you know, a much better way of handling this, a much better coronavirus plan. And so has Warren. And so I'm hoping that that wing of the party, that that's why he hasn't dropped out. Like, maybe he's trying to use his sway, but... Because we're in such a horrible crisis, you know, I think everybody is in just like existential peril. Nobody is thinking clearly. No one's really sitting around like reading the Bernie plan unless it just, you know, unless they're like a massive nerd like I am. You know, so I'm like the one of like a dozen people who actually read his plan and was like, good job, Bernie. But I, I just don't think it's like sinking into the American public like that there's a, even a debate happening. They're all like, yeah, Biden is going to be the guy the end. And so I don't know. Um, I mean, I, I keep wondering about all the angles of this. Like, how do you capture an audience if the media maybe isn't letting you on TV? Like, what exactly do you do to tell people the truth of what's going on and, you know, indicate the severity of the crisis, especially when they're scrambling, you know, struggling for survival? Like, we're all doing stuff like, you know, homeschooling our children all of a sudden and trying to figure out how to pay our bills. Like, everyone's got a lot of shit going on. And, I don't know. Um, I mean, on a personal level, like, I, I hope obviously he drops out by June, you know, because he, I don't think it's ca- he's capable of winning at this point, just in terms of the votes and supports Biden. And then we just go forward from there. But it's hard for me to even picture June because I don't know whether I'm going to be like sequestered in my house or, you know, what the death toll is going to be, the psychological effect of that. I, I don't know. Yeah. Oh boy. Well, um, 
I uh, to bring it on a more or fun note, uh, I wanted to give people some recommendations for their for their quarantine experiences. Now, I ha- I personally haven't had a lot of downtime. I don't know about you. I'm a person that actually works from home a fair amount anyway, and we're planning on homeschooling our children anyway. And so this is not this is like welcome to my world, people. But um, uh, you know it, it is still very jarring to know that you can't go out. Like we like to go out to this cafe not too far from our house, and that's like gone. We can't do that now. And it's like mm-hmm. it's a nice day out, and it's like don't no, I can't go out and be around other people. And it's just it's just very very upsetting. But what what have you been what what uh, hobbies, art, music, books, anything like what have you been u- using to keep yourself sane? Oh God, well, I listen to music all the time. I have like an apocalypse playlist. I, I put it up on my um, Gaslit Nation Patreon of, you know, just kind of end of the world songs, I mean, especially in the first couple of weeks. And um, I mean, music's always comforting for me, although it's sad. Like I had a lot of concert tickets for this year, you know, which I won't be able to to use. And so that's just a bummer because I liked being able to do that. Um but yeah, you know, I've been doing that. I've been binging Netflix. I've been, you know, watching old 80s movies with my kids. Like we watched National Lampoon Nash, um, like Vacation today, which they hadn't seen. And they thought it was funny because, you know, we are the losers who would take them on these giant road trips. So they were unfortunately recognizing me in, in Chevy Chase, but, um, which is not a good thing. But, you know, just sort of trying to like, I'm trying to make a good environment for the kids because they know that, like, you know, their mother's career apparently is doomsday profit, uh, which is not fun. You know, so I'm trying to make things more more fun and just watching stuff that I find comforting, like Bill and Ted and Beetlejuice, like all the movies from, like, my childhood. Like, they're now getting to see those. So. Nice, nice. Well, we right before all this happened, we, we just moved and we traded in. We had a bunch of old, like, video game systems. So we traded all those in for a new record player. So I have a bunch of old records that I've been uh, pulling out and playing with the kids. And my my five-year-old son, it's interesting. Like, I never would have expected the, the ones they gravitate to. He's listening to, like, John Denver. And then, like, my mm-hmm. my two-year-old daughter, she loves Van Halen and, like, oh, nice. the Ramones and Sex Pistols. Like, she's always pulling out the more <laughs> hardcore stuff. And I'm like, Emerald, you're a beast. Like, <laughs> it's, it's just, it's just awesome. been, a, yeah, it's been a fun experience <laughs> to go through that with them. But, yeah, he's... Uh, they, they have very surprising tastes in music but yeah that, that's been lots of fun but I've been trying to you know read books more obviously I read your book and, and I'm reading some others now and I'm playing guitar more than I have in the past and that's been fun so I've been trying to learn some songs uh, that I haven't been have you watched Tiger King? Yeah, yeah. We I think we just finished last night six episodes, right? We watched, I don't want to spoil it for anyone but you know he was in a in a bad situation, he was no longer the Tiger King in the one we uh, watched yesterday. So he was no longer the Tiger King. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, try- I'm trying not to ruin it for anyone. I think everybody knows that, but yeah, that was one of these weird things because it's like on Twitter, it's all basically public health advisories, apocalyptic doom, and Tiger King. Like that's what's like bringing our country together. So of course, I was watching Tiger King. <laughs> with everybody else and it was you know it was pretty interesting but I also felt uneasy watching it I was like in the beginning you know this is very entertaining and I kept thinking you know I've driven through that part of Oklahoma so many times because my sister lives in Dallas and you know when I drive from from St. Louis I either take the Arkansas route or I take the the Oklahoma route and so I kind of like you know know what it's like around there but then it got really disturbing and depressing, like as it went forward. And I feel like it's very much a sort of um, a commentary on our era and on the Trump era and how really awful people can just get, um, you know, viewed as entertainment when they're actually very dangerous. And so, you know, I, I recommend it. It was, uh, it was certainly interesting. <laughs> Well, definitely. And, you know, you, we talked about cult leaders, you know, before, and it's like they, they, they always seem to follow the same pattern. They've got wild hair and they're they're sexually promiscuous. And, they, you know, it's just like they, there's a music el- musical element all the time. And it's like, uh... yeah, well, that's something, honestly, that I'm expecting to see in the next year is just an eruption of cults. Because I think this virus and so many sort of apocalyptic end times type things, basically, you know, coming from climate change, like the fires and I don't know. And then you combine that with a general demise of authority on a national level, a loss of identity, 
I think that people are going to become very susceptible for new forms of community that provide them some sort of meaning, and they're going to feel panicked, especially if they're unemployed and they have nothing else to do. And so I've been worried about that since before coronavirus, but now that it's happened, I'm like, oh God, like I'm picturing kind of a scenario like in the you know, late 60s, early 70s, where all these weird cult-like, sometimes terrorist, you know, groups just were popping up all over the place. And I don't know, we, it seems like the time is ripe. I mean, you sort of see it with like QAnon and things like that, but I think it'll turn into more of a on-the-ground thing. Well, yeah, and then, I mean, we haven't even gotten into this yet, but there's a whole conspiracy theory in that way about, you know, oh, this is, the vaccine will have something in it that'll, maybe it'll track you or something, or I don't know, it has some... some I've seen that, and I, like, <laughs> I mean, I'm not completely sure they're wrong. Like, I really, I'm going to research this very thoroughly. I mean, obviously, if there's a vaccine, that, that would be great. Uh, you know, I hope that scientists, reputable scientists, create a vaccine. I am afraid of how they're going to abuse a vaccine. And I don't want to like tap into the whole anti-vaxxer thing, you know, of all the people who won't vaccinate for things like chicken pox or, me- or you know, smallpox, measles, etc. Obviously, you should vaccinate for that. But there are just so many evil people involved in this particular event and involved on the fringes of science. And there's so much area for manipulation. So what I'm hoping is that just, you know, good, trustworthy scientists and doctors, people with a long track record of honesty and integrity and transparency will explain the vaccine to the public. And it won't be like Jared Kushner explaining a vaccine to the public, because if that's what happens, I will be very, uh, I will be concerned. So hopefully everyone is, is thinking that one through. Oh my gosh. Yeah. When Jared Kushner <laughs> was talking the other day and it was saying, what would he say? It was it's our stockpile. It's not for the states. It's like who's R? What are you talking about? R is the mafia. Like R is them. And you know, not to go too far down conspiracy road, but I talked about this in the last Gaslit Nation that Trump is acting like he's immune. Like Trump is a notorious germaphobe. Like there are thirty years of articles, court documents, all of these you know books and information about Trump. Being someone who carries Purell with him all the time, carries wipes with him all the time, won't shake hands, won't touch elevator buttons. Like in, um, you know, sexual assault cases, they said that he made his victims wear gloves. Like he, this is just a phobia with him. Suddenly he's out there touching everybody. He's shaking everyone's hand. He's like slapping people on the back. And I'm like, wait a second. So an actual virus emerges that like, basically makes your neuroses seem rational. You know, like all the behavior Trump practiced his whole life is now what the CDC is saying you should do. So he stops doing it. And he's in the group that's the most likely to get the virus and die, like men over 70. I I think it's very weird. And it could just be like his psychology. It could just be, well, now that you're telling me to do it, I don't want to do it anymore. You know, it could be as simple as that. But Oh, I don't know. I mean, he's so narcissistic that I really thought if a pandemic emerges, he'd shut down the country to like protect himself because he's so important. The world revolves around him. And so, you know, God forbid anything, you know, threaten his mortality. But uh, that's not how he's reacted. He's reacting really weirdly. So I would kind of keep an eye on that. And I don't have an answer to that. It's just something I've noticed. And when I bring it up, by the way, I am besieged by Russian bots, as well as writers from Sputnik and from RT and from all of the Russian press saying he's not a germaphobe. He's not, you know, just repeating it. And I'm like, I can see you. I know who all of you are. I just wrote a book about you. You know, (laughs) so I don't know. It's it's weird. I I wish my life weren't this way. (laughs) I'm like listening to myself thinking this is insane. Like this is utterly insane. And like, I cannot believe that this is just what American life is like now. But here we are, <laughs> year four. So yeah, exactly. Well, I do really do recommend the book. It was it was a good reading, and I I really think everyone should read it. It like it's very prescient. It could have been written yesterday, and uh, it's you know it gets to a lot of issues that we've been talking about that people need to understand. So I appreciate you uh, all your work and. You know, definitely take care of yourself and, you know, try to stay sane in any way you can. And, you know, <laughs> you too. Thank you so much for having me on. No problem. Have a good night. All right, you too. Bye.
Join the Rob Burgess Show mailing list. Go to tinyletter.com forward slash the Rob Burgess Show and type in your email address. Then respond to the automatic message. Also, please make sure to comment, follow, like, subscribe, share, rate, and review everywhere the podcast is available, including iTunes, YouTube, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play Music, Twitter, Internet Archive, TuneIn, RSS, and now Spotify. The official website for the podcast is www.therobburgessshow.com. You can find out more about me by visiting my website, www.thisburgess.com. If you have something to say, record a voice memo on your smartphone and send it to therobburgessshow at gmail.com. Include voice memo in the subject line of the email. Also, if you want to call or text the show for any reason, the number is 317-674-3547. Until next time.